Today, we're shedding light on the Serapium. I'm NEXT, inviting you to join me for another Adept Expedition. Let's go in. The Serapium strikes many of us as being deeply mysterious. Look, here we have nubs. And I hope to reveal some of those mysteries here for you today as I guide you through the Serapium stone box by box. One of the mysteries is how they move these megalithic boxes into this subterranean chamber and then maneuver them through all the passages here that we'll see shortly. They wouldn't have been able to lower them from up above using sand hydraulics. Is it possible they built the chambers around the boxes? This just isn't plausible because the chambers are all built directly into the bedrock. These enormous megalithic boxes, we are told by the Egyptologists, are the sarcophagi for the apis bull. Let's take a closer look. Sometimes you have to look in not so obvious places to find answers. But other times, answers can be right in front of us, hidden in plain sight, the elusive obvious, or hidden in books, such as those in the archaeological record, which clearly describe how this passage was widened as part of an extension to a much older part of the Serapium. It was widened by Persian pharaoh Darius the Great of the 27th dynasty. And then he borrowed his way through this tunnel here, which extends the Serapium south just beyond this sarcophagus, which is not his. It's attributed to an apis bull corresponding to a later king. This one over here is his. And just beyond this doorway here, this is what takes us to the lesser galleries and the oldest extent of the Serapium. What we are looking at here marks a new tradition of granite boxes used for the Apis bull burials in the Serapium. Previously, the Apis bulls would have been buried in wooden boxes in the older part of the Serapium beyond the locked doors to our right. This red granite sarcophagus is the oldest of all the granite boxes we will see here in the greater gallery. And it exhibits detailed panels and well-preserved hieroglyphic inscriptions with funerary texts that are consecrated to the Apis bull, which was viewed as an aspect of Osiris in his earthly manifestation. Some historians will say that these were not sarcophagi intended for bull burials and offer alternative explanations ranging from resonating chambers to seed banks. Our imagination is left to wonder what would have happened inside the box when the lid was left on. What function did it serve and who built it? Well, when we carefully analyze its lid, which we passed upon entering the Serapium, which is often passed over by the casual tourist, we would find one of those clues hidden in plain sight. We first looked underneath, but if we were to look on top of the lid and brush aside the dust, we would find a hieroglyphic inscription. This text tells us how Amos II, aka King Amasis, Pharaoh of the 26th dynasty, that is the last indigenous dynasty to rule Egypt before the Persian conquest in 525 BC, had consecrated the sarcophagus to the living Apis bull in an exalted way by using costly granite stone. As the king found none had been made of this stone before him by any other king and that he may be the one who is given life enduringly. There also exists a stone stela now in the Louvre that Marriott had discovered in a niche inside the wall that once bricked up this very chamber. It explains how the king remembered what Horus did for his father Osiris, and so the living king in his role as Horus paid homage to the Apis as Osiris by making a great sarcophagus of this rose granite, because the king found that it had not been made in costly stone by any other king of his time. So there can really be little doubt about who made these granite boxes. Once again, we even have a hieroglyphic inscription here that is telling us the box is consecrated to the burial of the Apis bull. And as we leave Amos's box, we come upon this one here, which does not demonstrate the same level of craftsmanship. This was actually consecrated to the first Apis bull that passed during the reign of Darius. There was two, we'll see the second one in just a moment. But let us first take a look at this highly unusual gray granite box. Now this Apis bull sarcophagus is unlike any of the other Apis bull burials we'll see in the Serapium. Notice its height and the dimensions. 
it's a lot smaller than what we're going to see and as we push in close here you can see its surface is polished much like the interior we can see a cartouche and hieroglyphic inscriptions which lets us know it's attributed to the pharaoh kabash but again this is too small for an apis bull so what's really going on here well kabash led a revolt or rebellion against the persian pharaohs and he had a very short reign for about three years so because the granite stone box is too small for your typical apis bull burial, it's quite possible that it was used for the bull as a calf. Perhaps it passed at an early age. Or perhaps one of the other theories is that Kabash was rushed during his short reign and threw it together haphazardly. But what we don't see is beyond this box down the corridor leading to the south. I don't believe, at least to the best of my knowledge, that there's any footage on YouTube showing this. So I'm going to leak some footage that was given to me by a friend, shout out to Derek, who had access beyond the box and the footage will take us down the length of the corridor. Here we are in the chamber in vertical mode as it was captured on iPhone. We can see the tool marks that would have been from Darius during the time that he carved the tunnel. And to the right here, we can see the box, which was attributed to the Apis bull of Kabesh. But again, this tunnel was carved out by Darius, the Persian pharaoh, before him, and it extends further to the south, which would be in alignment with the axis of the original lesser galleries. This is the older part of the Serapium that you don't see, which is beyond that locked door that we took a look at earlier. And you can see we're going along the south here. And ultimately, it just truncates up here to the right. We've now come to the end here, so we'll turn around and head back. It's really a mystery why this was created in the first place. One theory is that uh, the Persian Pharaoh Darius was trying to extend the corridor and create this passageway to ultimately build a new set of tombs here inside the Serapium. What happened? Nobody really knows. For the time being, it will remain one of the unsolved mysteries of the Serapium. As we take a peek inside the box here, we can also see that it's polished on the interior. We are now going to get back on track and continue with the tour. And up over here, we can see all the man-laid bricks to form the arch, but it is here all burrowed into the bedrock. And so we can also see where they have these divots on each of the walls. These would have been used for pulleys and a rope system, which would have worked in tandem with a winch and wooden rollers to move these granite boxes through these passageways this is one of those mysteries people wonder how they were able to move these in the passageway there's such little width in between the box here and the chamber itself but it was all done with ropes how do we know this the tools were found in situ when Marriott first discovered the Serapium the wooden rollers were left behind and Augustus Marriott also found rails along the ground which are now covered up by the modern floor here we have another chamber inside is this gray granite sarcophagus its surface is processed but it's not polished its interior is polished and its inner corners are set at 90 degree angles over here we can see beneath the glass of the modern floor we can try to look for evidence of the pre-existing rails and then over here we have the chamber of another 27th dynasty pharaoh in this case it's darius ii and again we have a gray granite box its exterior and internal surfaces are processed but no polishing and this one over here again no polish red granite from aswan but the difference is this one's attributed to 29th dynasty pharaoh neferod and then over here, we have another 29th Dynasty Pharaoh, this one, Chagar. And over here, we have one that's a little different. This box is attributed to 30th Dynasty Pharaoh, Nekdenebu. Here we can see that the lid is damaged, the interior surfaces are polished, and the corners come out to 90 degree angles. We actually had the opportunity to get in and 
test this for ourselves during the Lost Technologies and Esoteric Symbolism Tour, which I co-led along with engineer Christopher Dunn. So this is the box that was accessible to me in 2001, and I climbed inside it and uh, applied my straight edge and, uh, and precision square. And that photograph is all over the internet now. All you've got to do is Google search it. He's got my tools, and he's going to clamber down there. Sure. And right. uh, check on the inside. But you need somebody with uh, a good flashlight with you, don't you? Sacred tools of Chris Dunn, this about to be revealed. And we are going to measure the exactness of the square <laughs> and of the flat precision surface. So what we have here is Christopher Dunn's tools. We're now about to go down inside the stone box and take measurements for ourselves. What should we start with, Chris? How did you start? Well, I just started uh, on that first wall there. I'm checking the flatness of it. Check the straight edge of uh, the uh, square, see how square the lid was to the sides. It doesn't look like it, but once you're inside the lip, it actually drops quite a bit in the <laughs> surface and, yeah, this and, this and, this and at the top I love this one. So we'll get, we'll get this corner and this flatness and then these corners. Okay, go for straightness just on that lid. Go ahead and shine the light underneath it from the other side, get the shadows. So nothing going underneath. Slight one right there. Bring it up one more time. Can you shine it from the back side? It's dead straight. Shaky hands. Now let's go for the square. <laughs> Look at the precision there, that's a dead square. All the way. No check from the other wall. Okay, I'm placing the no. square. Here we are in the box. The one's got the square. I want there's a little bit of light shining. Check the... Go to this corner. Check the roof square. I mean, perfectly flat. Yeah. For what purpose? That's the question, isn't it? The ceiling of the box. Uh, absolutely flat within the precision of Chris's instrument. The walls, uh, these two surfaces, absolutely flat into the tolerance of Chris's instrumentation. Uh, the squareness of the top or the uh, roof of the box is a little uh, just slightly out of the square, but by an incredibly small margin. Incredibly small. Uh, Listen to that echo. Just a hair out, but the flatness. Yeah, the flatness is really exciting. I've measured this one myself, and I can confirm that although this box is not perfectly precise, it does indeed have 90 degree angles. Like this one over here, which also has 90 degree angles. And the interior and exterior of this one are both polished. This sarcophagus was consecrated to the Apis Bull of Nectanebo II, the last indigenous pharaoh, as well as the third and last pharaoh of the 30th dynasty. His reign ended in 342 BC when he was defeated by the Persians. But in 332 BC, the Macedonian king Alexander the Great defeated the Persians, making way for the Ptolemaic dynasty of Egypt. This section, it's all Greek to me. Greek Ptolemies carved this new tunnel which wraps around from the entrance. And it was in this part of the Serapeum that a stela was found detailing how long it took to carve out one of the chambers 
and how long it took to place the Apis bull into its burial. This is evidence that the Ptolemaic Egyptians, the last dynasty of ancient Egypt, were not only responsible for building the majority of the Serapium that we see today, but also crafting the granite boxes and placing the Apis bulls inside. This empty chamber is not as wide as the rest, nor is it as uniform. Even though this chamber is the first we'll see here in the Greek section, it was likely the last to be carved out, and it was intended to contain a sarcophagus, now abandoned in the passageway, that we'll see on the way out. And down here, Looking through the glass beneath the modern floor, we can try to look for clues and see if we see any signs of the rails that were left behind and used to move the stones. It also gives us a sense of depth. Over here to the right, we can see the chamber for the Apis Bull of Ptolemy I. And over here, we have another glass that we can look through. The floor here is raised. We can see that it's a little bit higher. Once again, this would have been where they would have laid rails along the ground and allow the wooden rollers to pull the boxes using a rope and pulley and a winch system. If we go back over to this one, we can see that there's more depth. This is where they would have filled everything in with sand so that once they would have moved the boxes horizontally, they would have been able to lower them vertically using the concept of sand hydraulics. Again, taking a look at the Apis bull burial for Ptolemy I, and we can see the surface is processed but not polished. Over here, this chamber was for the Apis bull of Ptolemy II in his fifth regnal year. The external and interior surfaces are polished. And then we come to this one over here. Now this Apis bull burial box is also for Ptolemy II, but this time in his 29th regnal year, we can see the external surface is polished. But if you look close here on top, the lid is damaged. You see these divots. However, there is polishing over the damaged surfaces. You can see that right there. The inner part of this box is inaccessible. This is where they found that memorial tablet during the time of Ptolemy II inscribed with the information that explains how it took three months to carve the burial cave. This one with the red streak belongs to Ptolemy III. Its external and internal surfaces are both polished and the inside corners have 90 degree angles. You can also see some of the damage here likely caused by looters who are trying to pry open the lids. Most of the lids here are just slightly off. Looters would have used levers to pry these lids up. Here we have another Apis bull burial. This one's attributed to Ptolemy IV. You can see the lid is damaged. There's polishing over the damaged surface. The inner part of this one is not accessible. And then we come over here to this black granite box attributed to Ptolemy V. We can get a close up here of the divots. And you can see the surface again is polished. There's this external damage. And once again, the inner part of this box is not accessible. Looking up, we can see how the chambers burrowed into the bedrock. And as we move forward into the right over here, we can see the Apis bull burial for Ptolemy VI. Again, surface is polished, lid is damaged. And over here in this chamber is the box for Ptolemy VIII in his 27th regnal year. You can see the exterior surface is polished. The interior is inaccessible. If you look up here at the top of the chamber, in the ceiling archway here, you can see where they would have attached the pulleys as part of the pulley rope and winch system that was used to move the boxes around. You can see one right here, and then over here is another. And this is really a remarkable feat. If you can just imagine the ancient Egyptians in here using this system, this is really something else. And especially when you consider that this isn't pre-dynastic, it, it doesn't go way back to the Old Kingdom. This is Egyptians, Greek Egyptians, in the late dynasties of ancient Egypt, the Ptolemaic era, moving megalithic stones. The Science Against Myths YouTube channel provides us with a visual demonstration of how this would have been accomplished. And we do have records from the Egyptians saying that they had 30 workers. And again, we know Mariat discovered two winches inside the Serapium. And now in his 52nd regnal year, we have Ptolemy VIII again. 
This one is cool because the lid has this geometrical form. And over here is one more where the exterior is polished. This one is for Ptolemy the Ninth. But if we continue going up just a little further, the last one here on the left side is attributed to the famous Cleopatra the Seventh. But what I'm even more interested in is this over here. This is somewhat mysterious as it just seems to truncate. Let's take a look. If we were to remove this rubble away just a bit, this goes a little further back. Perhaps they're trying to make an extension. But if we get up over here and walk back to the next chamber, just around the corner here, we are going to come to the crown jewel of the Serapium. This finely made megalithic sarcophagus is polished both on the exterior and interior. And this lid here, well, it's not exactly precise. We took the opportunity to measure this on one of my recent tours. Let's take a look. What are, what are you doing here, Frank? What is Just it? trying to see how close it is to 90. And it's uh, 87.9, it looks like. Okay. And when we took a measurement the second time, it came out to 87.8. Still a remarkable piece of craftsmanship. So why is it then that we have these crude hieroglyphic reliefs? The one thing to keep in mind here is that the scribe is not the stonemason. In other words, those that are carving, fashioning, and polishing the boxes are not necessarily the same people that are going to inscribe hieroglyphs on them. Two different tradesmen, two different skill sets. This damage here would have already existed on the stone before it made its way into the Serapium, where the craftsman would have put the polish over the damage, and then the initiated priests, the scribes, would have inscribed the hieroglyphic text on top of that. Why is the text so haphazard? Why do we have these crude hieroglyphs on precision stone boxes? Well, they were likely done in an effort with urgency. They're trying to rush to get this done because this, was, this box was installed at the very end of the Ptolemaic dynasty when the Romans were about to invade. So it may have been a last effort on behalf of the priesthood to get this dedication text up. Uh, venerating Apis Osiris. The text refers to Apis Usur Osiris and talks about how the king shall stand behind him and how the king shall not perish and will remain for all eternity. Now some people like to say that the stone was melted in dynastic times, perhaps by some alchemical mixture, though I had a geologist on one of my tours and we don't think that's the case. This cavity back here, somewhat of a mystery, not sure if they're trying to extend it or what was happening here. But what we can say is that we do know that this is an Apis bull burial box and it's attributed to Ptolemy XII in the late Ptolemaic dynasty of ancient Egypt. It is not part of the old kingdom. It does not go back to a pre-dynastic era. This dedication text over here on the east side references the Apis, Osiris, and Horus coming to his succession and bringing hearts for the gods and uh, making a statement not to cry out in pain and Horus giving the eye, which must be carried by the crown before the nine gods. You can see the nine Neteru. Call a god, but it's not really a god. It was a divine principle, an aspect of nature or cosmology. And when you have two, the dual, it becomes a Netawi. Two or more of something in ancient Egyptian, you add the E, so like the two lands. Land is Ta, so you'd have Ta We if you have two. But if you have three or more of something, then you add the U, so Netaru, many Netchers. Netaru. Absolutely amazing. And again, you can come see the Serapium firsthand up close for a hands-on experience here in Egypt as part of my next Adept Expeditions tour, which you can join. To join my major group tours, you can visit adeptexpedition.com or you can go straight to the tours page, adeptexpeditions.com forward slash tours. Looks like we have a group coming down right now. Yes, but I'm for the hands
está la montaña, o si está la montaña con esto, pero mira, estamos abajo de la montaña. Mira cómo todos los sarcófagos, mira cómo está por fuera ustedes. ¿Cuántos son? So we're now going to exit through the passage here, and there's one more great mystery that remains. Again, the other proposed ways that they would have brought the boxes in this way, angle them around through here, and brought them down. Let's, let's continue on through this passage toward the exit and take a look at the box that is over here, left in situ. Be right on this side, but first let me give you a quick look over here. Again, you can see how we are underground, how the bedrock has been burrowed out, and we're now going to exit. Just up ahead is another one of these gray granite boxes. Notice the very prominent curved shape. The external surface is processed, but if we come up over here and take a look inside, you'll notice that the internal surface is actually higher quality than the external. And so it's really rough in comparison to all the other sarcophagi, which indicates that this piece was left unfinished. Why is that so? Because again, this would have been part of that last attempt to get a sarcophagus in through these tumultuous times as the Romans were about to invade. Now, I showed you an empty chamber when we first approached the Ptolemaic Greek section in the greater galleries of the Serapeum. That was likely the chamber that this box was intended to sit in. But for whatever reason, perhaps everything happened with the Romans. They just left this piece here in situ. Just looking around the bottom here to see if we can find any evidence, any indicators that this was on rails or the wooden beams don't really see much. So again, we can take a look up at the interior. The interior is superb. It is very nice quality in comparison to the exterior as well as other sarcophagus. And over here, we have these niches in the wall, these little alcoves. This is where we would have found the memorial texts, the stela. When the French Egyptologist Auguste Mariat first rediscovered the Serapium, he found contained within it all of the stela, these tablets that were essentially embedded into the walls, into these niches and alcoves, along with the hieroglyphic text we see on the wall, and many were scattered across the floor. Collectively, these, along with those that were discovered in the Iceum, which again is just north of the Serapium, it's consecrated to the mother of the Apis bull and associated with Isis. If we take all of these stela together, they give us a pretty good documentation of not only who, but built the Serapium, but when the Serapium was built, as long as, as well as the function of these boxes. We know that they were for the Apis bulls, and there's actually accounts that are referencing the number of workmen and how long it took them to get the bull to the Serapium and how long it took to hollow out the caves or the chambers within Serapium. So this is very interesting that we still have this all of this information available to us. You can actually see a lot of these stela. Uh, they're held in the Louvre Museum as part of their collection. You can view them online. And this enormous stone that we just passed now behind us is a lid, likely intended for this sarcophagus. And this concludes our tour of the Serapium. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a like. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments down below. And if you haven't already done so already, please do subscribe for more videos like this one. Just keep in mind that we wanna think outside the box, but remember the deepest truths 
can always be found by going within. And if you like this, I strongly suggest you watch the next two videos I put up on the screen because these are the videos that YouTube thinks you should be watching.